with panels entitled Fisher the Land, and it deals specifically with the crisis that has taken place over the last almost two decades in Kashmir. And she and I, Sonia, have worked quite extensively with this particular issue. And, and as you know, this symposium is very much concerned with crises of various kinds and how we collectively find ways of, uh, I guess, at the most basic level, surviving, uh, but also coping, and in some cases, perhaps in some way moving beyond the wounds, the ruptures that are attendant on the variety of crises we find on ourselves. Um, Sonia, the question I think that you posed to my and not chose before I thought was, was a very important one since I think the point of what, why we're here, that what, uh, what are the solutions that we can find or how can we find to, uh, how can we deal with them, how can we uh, create new possibilities other than what we've already had and confront. So I want to pose that same question to you and to Shiva in terms of, uh, of your practices and what, you know, what do you think is also the function of your work? Um, <clears throat> actually, most times it's uh, based on desire to, to, to create from, uh, for most times. Uh, I find my response is one of just complete silence because I am overwhelmed. Yes. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, both the film on its hold right now and the video work uh, is because I was asked to to make yeah. make the work. Um, and so, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not there looking for. A, a subject to, to create work around. Sure. Um, um, I've been an activist for a long time, and uh, that's how I got into Kashmir. And uh, the work is a uh, manifestation, if you would, of concerns. Um, and it, it, for me, <laughs> it has to be wrung out. Uh, I find it very difficult to actually uh, make work around distress. Um, uh, in fact, uh, even as I, you know, this work was made in 2009, and uh, even as I was um, putting it up, I found I was very uncomfortable uh, because, you know, um, I photographed uh, these families of the disappeared for many years, yeah. and so I, I um, I've been with them and I, I know them very well. Um, and there's a deep discomfort I have. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's it's something so, I mean, in a sense it's a, it's a public issue, but the grief is a very private grief. And I have photographed that very private grief. Uh, and here I am showing it in a gallery. Um, and then the people come in and saying, you know, oh, I really like your work, and I think, you know, what does that mean? Uh, so, there's a deep discomfort of packaging. I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, to say this, so I don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. Um, and that's the most honest answer. I think for me, there's uh, also a movement in terms of how I relate to and engage with such situations over the years. So the Kashmir work is really begins in the mid 90s <coughs> and has its own kind of slow mutations, both in form and in content. Uh, but to come to the question that comes out of what Sonia is saying, uh, the question of representing trauma is a vexed one because it assumes a kind of separation between the person who is doing the representing, creating the work, uh, whether writing or imaging or whatever form, 
and be represented. And I think one of the crucial issues that uh, I've really reflected on in my practice as a photographer and now as a photo-based <coughs> installation maker is about actually refusing to allow the discomforts that arise from that alterity, from being different, from being in a more privileged position, relating to someone in a less privileged position or in a traumatic position, to actually generate something that I think of as intersubjectivity, where what we generate between us is something that is neither me as who I am, or the person, the woman in that particular situation, but something that gets produced between us, and therefore the representation or the work that arises from that is actually grounded in that intersubjectivity and belongs, in a sense, to both and neither. Mm -hmm. And that, that the production of that is the first step towards public articulation. So for me, that private grief actually gets transformed when it actually speaks to the listener. And then, so it is already moved into a kind of articulation. It is also already seeking to make itself intelligible. Uh, there is much that is unintelligible, particularly in speech. And that's another area of concern that perhaps we can return to later. Um. I, I just, um, I don't know whether this is a particularly cynical phase of mine post the last elections. Um, I really wonder about you know, the work we, we do or the, the stuff we write or the stuff we put out and, um, in very small um, situations like this. I've always had this question. I've had it with Amrita um, earlier. Like how, in the face of uh, of a very overwhelming mass media and its, its impact uh, in the way that, that that mass media, corporate interests, military industrial complex all come together. You can actually manufacture consent from uh, a huge country like India, uh, which, is, which, is, which is actually so divided, uh, one, one could never imagine that a political situation would arise where you have. Um, a government like this one in power. Um, I can't believe uh, those of us who have worked on Gujarat, I can't believe that people have forgotten it wasn't so long ago. You know, uh, what does it mean? It's, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, it was 50 years ago. And we have this man who was responsible for mm -hmm. mass murder to become prime minister in a very legitimate way, in a very legal way, <laughs> in mm -hmm. a way that you can't challenge. Um, and all kinds of other things have been manufactured, like his so-called clean chit. You know, so mm -hmm. what do we, you know, what are we talking about when we, we we're here, we, we make this art, or we make, we write something? And we, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I feel our, our challenge is, is so feeble, it's better to just shut up maybe for a while. Isn't there um, perhaps a danger though if, if, if you do you know, shut up for a while that um, the, the various things that tend to disappear from our <laughs> mind or sight, uh, they become worse? I don't I think a lot of what one does is bearing witness and it may seem to be something that doesn't alter the conditions that we bear witness to, but we do develop some sort of archive which is outside this mainstream narrative, which offers the possibility of some other way of reading these histories or these political moments and exists in palpable form. It may lie dormant, may not be accessed, at particular points, it may be accessed at other points, 
but to produce it, I think, becomes part of our responsibility as, as much as we bear witness to the new I image regimes of the kind of very skillful, highly technological production of what seems to be a national consensus. I would be cautious about assuming it's a consensus. I think cracks are appearing and are there. Uh, it's precisely because of that that we have to create and produce these other stories. One of the things that, um, that a lot of literature, psychological <coughs> literature suggests, uh, particularly for victims of various kinds of traumas, uh, it, it is that often that's accompanied by silence, by the inability to speak, by the inability to somehow express or uh, come to terms with what's happened. Uh, uh, and I just wonder if the work you do might be a, a, a means of countering that response, that what you could call a, a post-traumatic response perhaps, since it does appear to, of course there are representations of what you create, but <coughs> related back to what you said, Shiva, there's also an encounter uh, between you and the people that you are engaging with in this particular situation. No, um, I really feel that um, <coughs> I, I, I'll go again into Gujarat and then into Kashmir. You know, this this denial that something has happened, this denial that, that these people were involved, and that everybody buys into that, and so that creates a reality. Yeah. Which everybody buys into. Now, uh, this this video work on Kashmir, granted on the it's about the, the disappeared. Yeah. And um, when you spend time with those families, you know, they start. Uh, the, the, each one, as when, when they related the story, each one has come to a point where they actually, very sincerely, question their own sanity, whether the person actually existed, because there is just denial about the existence of that person. And often, the only sign that that person who's now been disappeared mm. ever existed is a small photograph, is like a passport size photograph. Mm -hmm. So this that the, the state or the system uh, can change reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's so dystopian, it's so amazing, it's, it's uh, unbelievable that we actually live this today. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, asked Amar about when I asked him this question, he put it in my head. You know, what is an appropriate response? I don't know. I, because it's, I, I feel great frustration that, that the response is contained. Uh, and I'm not saying that, that I, I want to do something uh, with mass media and that, that every single uh, you know, that what I have to say has to be understood or received by thousands and millions of people. It's not that. It's just, it's just that um, whether it's uh, conferences um, about ideas or uh, alternative conferences, uh, I was very much part of the anti-nuclear movement. Um, we, we're always speaking to the converted. We're always speaking to the converted. Uh, I know Shiva has made some move to, to go beyond that, to reach out to a wider audience. Um, and, and I think it's... Uh... You know, you're just uh, <coughs> taking me into a place which is very familiar, which I inhabit a lot of the time, which is of political despair. Mm -hmm. And in fact, after Ian's presentation in the morning, I said that 
with this description of the impossibility of escaping neoliberal capitalism, where you are complicit and produced by it, uh, and that there is no other space, uh, can actually produce a state of complete despair. So how does one then actually make any kind of movement out of that despair? So the despair you're describing is completely familiar to me and for the same reasons as much, uh, you know, it's not that I don't share this feeling. But I do believe that this possibility of keeping other imaginaries alive, this possibility of other possibilities, mm -hmm. the mere marking of them, the mere stating of them, and it, it increasingly becomes that in, in the kind of condition where uh, all forms of expression are appropriated almost before they have been articulated, uh, where the radical is continuously recuperated into the center. And back to, for me, a very interesting example of that is the kind of speech that our Prime Minister made, speaking of how boys have to be educated in terms of uh, gender issues. Now, this is something that is kind of coming up um, with the women's movement and internationally as an addressing of masculinity. And this person, which we stand for some of the most violent, patriarchal, misogynist principles, ideologically, actually is able to pick this up and make it part of his speech to the nation. So, so there's this, this is a very complex moment that we occupy. However, to give in to the despair is also to give in to uh, to then being a passive subject who is only produced by the conditions that surround you. So I am only then the product of my conditions. And I do believe that I, am, I have possibilities of being different from that. I don't say more, but different. And that difference needs to be marked. So even if it is only to mark that difference, the the urge to move, the urge to speak, does come from that. Yeah. In, in, in moments of light, in the gloom of political despair. Uh, what you touch on is really important, this idea of despair, this experience of despair, and that is something that we relate to as well. It's, it's something that uh, actually Franco Bico Berardi has has written about in, in a way it's an extension as well as a critique of, um, of, of Boitano's work. And the point he makes is that, of course, you have capitalism and schizophrenia. And in a sense, schizophrenia is a symptom of capitalism. But Berardi also suggests that depression has been overlooked by Boitano. And in fact, he, he characterizes Boitano's later years, his winter years, as one marked by depression. Uh, but I like what you said in that, uh, what, what do you do with this despair? Do you simply give in to it? Uh, what happens then? Or do you fight it? And, and it seems that what you're suggesting is that there's something important in being able to uh, <coughs> deal with that despair. Marking the despair is not fighting the despair or moving out of it, it is simply marking it. <coughs> and the fact that it is despair is in itself a statement. Mm. So I, I think despair is not a, a, a place to be treated pejoratively. Mm -hmm. Sure. It can be productive space. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not sure I use the word despair. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think I'm just very angry at this moment and um, um, I think uh, uh, there, is, there is a frustration in the inability to communicate and uh, uh, <coughs> sometimes I feel uh, in times like this, maybe it's it's better. I can't speak for anybody else, but I, I can say for myself that it's better to be in retreat 
to be in retreat. In retreat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, you know, it's uh, nothing you say. Nothing you say. In situations like Kashmir or in Gujarat where there's been injustice, how do you redress it? You know, okay, you can report it, you can you can talk about it, you can make art around it, but how do you actually redress it? How do you uh, and and maybe that's not the work of artists, maybe that's not the work of writers. But surely it is uh, to bring about some kind of uh, change in the consciousness of people that people say, yes, this is wrong, and that, yes, there should be some redress of it. Uh, if there's a complete denial that this ever happened, where do you start? Where do you start that process of redressing? I think what I was raising this morning was that there is the evidence. There is the crime, there is the evidence. However, somehow people are still unable to care about what that adds up to. Oh, no, so, so it is no longer the fact, the need to establish the crime, the crime is established. Shiva, but I just, feel like, 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 I just feel like this is, this is what we are as a people. No? We, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't even, like, somebody the other day was talking about partition. And like, you know, how do you redress partition? You don't. Everybody just sweeps it under the carpet and we just go along. You know, you sweep 1984 under the carpet and you go along. You sweep Gujarat under the carpet and you go along. You sweep Kashmir under the carpet and you go along. You just hurtle along. Uh, I want to come back to this question of silence because for me it was very interesting that partition was something that actually wasn't talked about that much in public domain till about 40 or 50 years after the experience. And curiously enough, while the 14th or 15th year was being celebrated by the state, there was for uh, a widespread, on the street corners of everybody who went to families, a kind of discussion about partition and, and the capacity to grieve for it became possible after many years of silence. And I think one of the things that happens with silence in the face of trauma is that we often want to force it too quickly into speech and that it needs to be honored as a form of speech. Uh, we uh, very often in our struggle for justice focus on testimony because with the kind of uh, orchestrated power <coughs> structures with many uh, forces in collusion to produce a particular incident of violence or trauma it is only the testimony of those who have faced that violence that you actually have as evidence. In this doing, what we tend to do very often is to freeze testimony. For testimony to stand up in court, it needs to be consistent. It mustn't change over time. On the other hand, when you go through a horrific experience, every retelling, you change the story, and that change is part of healing and allowing the mind to keep in consciousness an actually unspeakable experience. So there's some very peculiar kind of contradiction taking place in, in this, uh, because a lot of the currency of the kind of work of generating evidence of state brutality particularly is testimony. So I thought we could think a little bit about testimony, yeah. which is very much part of the work that you produced yeah. and uh, the work we did together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just remembering, I mean, as you were speaking, yeah, um, the film, What Was Found in Pine Country, was made for uh, the South Asian Court of Women, which was held in Dhaka. And then, uh, you know, the, the only reason I made the film was because uh, uh, the people who were organizing the conference wanted uh, some Kashmiri women to come out uh, to uh, test, uh, testify on displacement and then uh, they asked me for it at the very last minute and we couldn't get their passports together and so then they said, Look, can you video them? And uh, so that's how this film was made. It was actually made for this Now the irony of it is that they didn't allow, it was a event sponsored conference. Yeah. And 
myself, a small group of four women, which didn't include Sonia at that time. We travelled and spent some time moving around uh, the Kashmir Valley and meeting and talking with women. It was a very complex thing to do because mm. we were 94, sorry, it's 94. Uh, it was complex in many, many levels. For one, we really were, uh, I think we, we just went uh, without much protection except for the one uh, member of the team who had a journalist card, but otherwise we just went just as concerned women. Uh, we had to establish ourselves as not representing India. We also had to find a way to speak to women who were always behind the men. So you had to first uh, develop these possibilities. Very often we'd split up and some of us would speak with the men and saw themselves as rightful representatives and then go and talk to women. Uh, I just want to think that Kashmir was really pretty dangerous in those days and you had a lot of um, uh, mercenaries in the area. Um, it wasn't it wasn't so sanitized yeah. even even though yeah, so they were they did a very brave thing by yeah. going in actually. So in that period we uh, basically opened a space of listening and what we would say was that Nobody really knows what the women have to say. Uh, the discourse on Kashmir, the mainstream media discourse, as well as the human rights discourse, actually seem to have women figure only as victims or as, uh, in a particular period of the beginning of the Azadi movement, as students part of protests, etc. But there was no voice of women. So at a very simple, almost simplistic level, what we simply wanted to do was to gather these voices and to bring them into the public domain. We did that with, I'm, I'm sort of skipping a lot because sure. it will just get too long. So we produced a report, which was not the classic fact-finding kind of report that human rights groups have been producing for quite a while. We didn't focus on state violence, torture, atrocities, but in fact we focused on how women were perceiving their situation and how they were surviving. So it was a very different way of trying to understand what was happening. What was happening was, uh, I mean, I, for six months after that, every night I dreamed of Schmidt. Uh, it, it was extremely painful and very difficult to encounter all of that. I may was a caveat before joining the team, as a photographer, that I would not photograph um, tortured or mutilated bodies or instances of violence because I had <coughs> encountered, through particularly the human rights discourse, a, a large, both the uh, freedom movement and the human rights discourse had produced a large number of images of that kind, which I actually felt it produced only closure and in fact dehumanized the, uh, the victims that were being presented because it was a kind of victim discourse. So I made that a kind of baseline decision even before I went because it was a desire to actually, in a sense, humanize a highly polarized discourse and, and a discourse which had gotten saturated with violent images. So the report was uh, not a classic fact-finding report, faced a lot of opposition and uh, contestation. Coming out of that, one of the things that we felt was what we heard continuously and also what we were aware of was the very next telling of history. So we went into an exercise and that's when Sonia actually joined us. I joined as a Callum Youth researcher. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent a huge amount of time in the archives actually pulling out material from 1942 to the present day, uh, to the end of the 90s, so I'd say early 2000s. Uh, you know, yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm not very good with uh, dates, as you can see. Uh, so we engaged with that history and what we found was actually 
very simply, a complete domination of the public discourse by sets of men with guns. Whether they were brave soldiers defending India's borders, whether they were uh, freedom fighters struggling for independence, they were sets of men with guns, and the women's perception of them was as such. And their experiences of both the militants, the freedom fighters, the Azadi struggle, and the army was not dissimilar from their subject position as women. So out of that, we created uh, one first form of the installation, uh, which basically uses testimony, photograph, and historical narrative. Uh, we also introduced several poetic threads from the patron saint of Kashmir and the famous Sufi woman saint of Kashmir. And we took this to the Beijing um, conference, that was I think 95 or 96. And it was in the peace tent, and what was very interesting there was both being able to open up this question with other women from South Asia, as well as a conversation with women from Rwanda, women from Ireland, there were many women from conflict situations who were trying to open up another way of thinking about conflict situations. So the stories that are not told of all the, you know, the, the secret exchange of sugar and milk between so-called enemies uh, became quite important in uh, re-articulating and altering this discourse. From there, the, uh, the next movement of the, uh, the installation was at the Hager Field of Peace, where we inserted the installation in the corridors of the Congress in the Hague. And uh, they were uh, different groups representing Kashmir, present there, from the extreme funded uh, representation to various, um, various <laughs> shapes. Kashmiri politics is very fractured and uh, uh, contested. So at the end, the world, I don't have a sense of just how contested, because there were also represent, uh, representatives from the Pakistani side of Kashmir, who had, you know, then there were the Pakistanis, but, uh, Kashmiris who were pro-Pakistani state, there were people from Azad Kashmir who were anti-Pakistani state, so that would be for a sense of, my God, it's not just, it's not just one simple story, but there's so much more to it. You've actually mentioned that uh, Kashmir is a, a microcosm for what's happening in many parts of the world. Could you say a bit more about that? I think there are, if you look at the map of the world, there are X number of declared wars, and there is a very large number of undeclared wars mm -hmm. of, this, uh, of these kinds of conflict situations. They're not always linked to uh, sub-nationalisms, but there are a large number of sub, sub uh, struggles as well. But uh, deep, deeper underlying that is, in fact, the turning to arms of genuine democratic uh, struggles. Because it is what happens to struggles when they take up arms and when the sets of controls actually change. So that is something you see reproduced across the world today. So there are many ways in, the, in which one can find uh, similarities between what's happening in Kashmir and elsewhere. And it's not just about Islam, but that's another range of uh, you know, uh, sets of comparisons that you could make. I mean, it's still sounding hugely oversimplified and we're skimming through large yeah. tracts of history. I just want to come to the end of the narrative sure. of the many ways that the installation changed. Finally, it took on a form that was shown in Delhi. Uh, it was impossible to show this one. Nobody would touch it. Uh, it. It was just too hot. It was also the Egyptian government at that time, and people were very nervous. Under the umbrella of a Women in Conflict seminar, we finally got a space to show this in the Habitat Center. A few, maybe two days before the uh, opening of the installation, uh, we were asked whether we would allow the Ministry of External Affairs to vet the installation, and we flatly refused. 
and said that we would take whatever consequences came. So the organizers actually removed their name from the space entirely. We were on our own. And this was quite interesting because there was fear of goons coming in and smashing the installation, all kinds of reprisals, <coughs> even from the state, even from uh, right wing thugs, etc., etc. Because we were doing a couple of things in the installation which uh, were uncomfortable for a lot of people. Uh, what happened was very interesting. Uh, we basically, the installation actually tries to open a third space to move out of this highly polarized. Hindu, Muslim, India, Pakistan, patriot, uh, traitor, terrorist, etc., etc., all those binaries. And in that first encounter with the installation, people, all kinds of people, came into that space and they actually took the opportunity of that third space. And it was extraordinary to see the response. One of the things we did, and it's very much to do with uh, modes of practice is that rather than putting testimony and photograph uh, on the wall, which is the standard way in which one encounters such material, well, we actually placed it in rusted iron books on a series of brick platforms on the floor. So you had to actually make an effort. You had to sit down, lean over, to even read or encounter one of the images. And it also served to slow people down. It was a kind of processional movement around the whole installation, which again served to alter the meeting with these experiences. <coughs> uh, the, there was a huge amount of response also from the media, and by the third day, the organizers had put their names back mm -hmm. in the space, <laughs> which was cut in the uh, the institution has since traveled in several contexts, but now that form has stayed. And the historical, which was so important to us when we began this process, has actually become just a gesture. And I think that's also interesting because we found that keeping the attention on the, the actual voices and experiences of these women spoke more powerfully than anything else. It's an interesting little history. Yes. What do you think? <coughs> uh, for me, one of the most memorable, memorable works is Gandhi's daughters. And, uh, and then you portray the colour line and, and aesthetics of the aesthetics. And it, you, you, you said that these women seek to transform themselves in certain ways both socially and internally, and in the moment. I really like that because it suggests that one does not need to be directly and socially engaged in order to participate in social transformation. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. I would just go back to <coughs> kind of mode of photographic practice grounded in intersubjectivity. And a lot of my early work was building up a record of the women's movement in Delhi. Uh, I moved out of the documentary mode to build collaborative portraiture, uh, questioning the power structures inherent uh, in documentary and questioning the lie of documentary truth, because documentary presents itself as truth. If this is one of the Useful. It's one of the illusions of power <coughs> that the documentary is presented. It's true that we often present our alternative truths, but I wanted to question that. So we moved into stage work. And that work is that practice or that way of working is what underlies the meetings with the women ascetics. I got very interested in these kind of women through the poetry of the women ascetics from the fourth century onwards. It is extraordinary poetry, very contemporary in its declarations, and it negotiates what is set up as a binary, which is sexuality, spirituality, the sacred and the profane, in very, very interesting, complex ways. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time with um, women ascetics of different denominations, and what I found was very interesting, because I found a performative remaking of self. Uh, just 
as a banal ethnographic example, uh, to be initiated, you actually perform your own death rites. And you die to your, to your name, to your family's name, to your village's name, etc., 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 up to seven previous generations. So it is a complete negation of the social identity that you were born with and a reinventing of self through the identity that you take on as an ascetic, which is within coded traditional structures. <coughs> However, it has its own spaces of liberation. What was very interesting was the play with gender, because many of these women actually became quite androgynous. And uh, we think of gender play and uh, performativity of gender as something that we've really been thinking about only recently while these are practices that uh, go back a very long way and are enacted in very, um, very interesting and very rich ways within these communities. So it's a body of work that I show as a photo video installation, uh, but I do want to say that uh, both Kashmir and the work of the women aesthetics is work of um, quite long ago when my practice has changed substantially and I do quite different things now. Would you say more about what you are doing now? Uh, perhaps I think it would be good for this time to stay with the, some of the questions around representing trauma. Yeah? <laughs> Maybe open it up. And, yeah, yeah, why don't we? Could you say some more about that? Do you retreat to return? Or do you retreat to retreat um, and step away forever? And why do you, what happens when you retreat? See, the point is I, I, I don't see myself as an artist or a writer. Or, uh, I, I've done many things in life. So, um, but I've always seen myself as somewhat of, of an activist. Um, so, of course, one feels that one will come back, uh, um, and and I I don't I don't uh, I don't really see myself as retreating. I mean, I I I just don't have the means right now um, because of circumstances as well. Uh, I have been forced into retreat. Um, so you disappear. Do I disappear? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm at the moment uh, uh, running a tea estate, so I'm a farmer, uh, and I have a little baby. So I, yes, I have disappeared from, from the public. Yes, uh, for a while. It's not, it's not that one ever stops thinking or. Uh, I look forward to your return. I beg your pardon. I look forward to your return. Thank you. You said something about how becoming a mother uh, really changed something in the way you looked at the work. You did on the disappeared. Do you want to talk about that? Not just the work on the disappeared, Shiva. I mean, I just, um, you know, I, I've always loved children and I, I, I always knew that I would have a child, but now that I have a child, I. I, I just don't understand how the world works. Uh, you know, I really spent 15 years um, in this conflict zone, uh, trying to understand conflict, trying to understand uh, the politics of it, trying to understand uh, what motivates people to actually kill, and how do you actually kill, uh, or to generate Anger and hatred enough to to to, to do that to um, and and you know I, I really thought I had some some answers and, and I, I I thought I knew uh, quite a lot uh, now with Tara I I just feel like um, you know I'm so careful. Like I won't even raise my voice because you know one day I, I raised my voice in front of her and she got so startled and I was so you know the desire to protect her was uh, so I know I will never raise my voice so how do you create when you have children how do you create a world that is so violent and how do you not want to 
so I, I, I don't know why the, uh, I don't know how this, this world has come about, really. I mean, I, this may sound completely naive and stupid, I don't know, but I really don't understand this. I would do nothing. I would do everything to protect that. Uh, you know, if she gets a scratch, it, it, it would hurt me. I, I can't imagine what these poor women and the, the families of the disappeared have gone through. I, I cannot imagine. Um, and so also, you know, the grand narratives of bravery and martyrdom, I don't understand why people push their children into war or when they, the children go into war. How can you, as a father, say, oh, I'm proud that my son died in Gardale, or I'm proud that he died for my nation, or I'm proud, I mean, where does that come from? So, um, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I feel like a lot of that what I've said is, is um, making me feel, making me seem that I'm very alienated from from normal society or from the way things are, but really I, I find it, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging that person. I mean, I, I feel like that, that poor father who says, yeah, I'm, I'm proud that my son died for his country. Um, I'm sure the I'm sure he's suffered a lot for him to have said that. Um, but I, I, I don't understand. I really don't. Sorry, this, this just closes the conversation. <laughs> I seem to be one of the people who initiated the gloom, um, <laughs> which was not my intention. Um, so there's two kind of sort of two American critics uh, of the last decade, Naomi Klein and Rebecca Solnit, who I think uh, are in many ways um, voices in the wilderness. Um, but the thing that they say, which I think is important to remember at this point, is that what you do as activists is to de-legitimate the regimes that cause the despair. And you shouldn't shouldn't underestimate how powerful that is and how important that is. So something like uh, Occupy New York was a very powerful statement. It didn't necessarily change the world, but it initiated a process whereby people began to find a way to delegitimate the idea of unequal wealth, to delegitimate the idea of consumer capitalism. And I think you know that's what artists are doing, and that's what people who uh, make films like you have and to bear witness that's the crucial thing that you're doing. So you can't judge what you're doing by an immediate result. You know, there is no key performance indicator for being an artist. You didn't make a piece of work that changed the world like that. But what you have done is created the space and the conditions to delegitimate a hegemonic authority and to you know, create some cracks uh, in that system. And I think that's really powerful and really important. It doesn't mean that it won't you know, kind of make you feel just that despair again, or you won't feel that it's futile. But for the rest of us who kind of take uh, sustenance from that, it's immensely important. So you know, you have to kind of reach out to the to the to the many and recognise that you know, what you're doing is important to us because you have the courage and the creativity to delegitimate the hegemony, and more importantly, to make us recognise that there was a hegemony. I mean, the point of what I was trying to say this morning was simply that. Very often, we don't even know that we're in the thrall of power. We think that we are in control of our devices. But uh, in fact, as I was trying to say, very often those devices control us. We are here at the, uh, the beck and call of those machines. But to bring that to people's attention, begin to change how people see the world around them, is an immensely powerful thing. It doesn't yield immediate rewards, but nonetheless, it's important and powerful. So, you know, please take heart. You know, bear witness to yourself, you're doing good work and keep it up. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean, I would make part of the results of the accumulation, for example. 
sorry, I think I would take heart from the Sri Lankan election results, for example, because you know the same kind of language. I mean, I had a student from Jatna from the university, and I remember the despair, I remember his, you know, lament, and I remember his sadness every single day when he was with me. And I think I've taken heart from the results of the Sri Lankan elections for sure. But this is uh, for you, Shiva, uh, because uh, if you look at photography and the images of Kashmir that were produced in the 1930s. And I was recently reading Bendre's uh, biography, and he was in fact one of the earliest people to start taking these uh, photographs for the Tourism Bureau, which was set up in the 1930s. And he describes a specific incident where he meets with resistance to being photographed, right, by the local uh, people. Now, you mapped out a kind of a trajectory of the camera and the images that were produced by the camera. You have these heroic images of the soldiers that were produced by the information and broadcasting ministry right to the 40s and 50s. Then you have, you know, these uh, images of destruction and, you know, you know bodies. And, and then you have your intercepted subjective kind of images that you produce. Uh, I was just wondering, what was the nature of the technology, or was it the ubiquity of the photographic image that these women were now familiar with that actually allowed them to work with and to produce these kind of images? Because I think the witness function, in some sense, is a counter image that these women were trying to produce for themselves as well. Uh, I would say that this has already changed radically because in the early 90s, the digital camera was not as ubiquitous in Kashmir as it is today. So whatever one is saying is actually to do with that period because this huge change in the capacity to produce images has followed. So if you look at a place which had, where photography was at the camera, was either in a studio where you went to be photographed for, you know, fun or marriage or things like that, important social events in a particular individual life, or was in the hand of the state, or was in the hand of journalists. So here was a camera that was actually not part of these. And the camera came out actually after having built some kind of relationship. So when I speak of the intersubjective space, it is not created by um, going in with the camera. And, and it doesn't begin like that. There's actually a considerable amount of time spent developing a kind of conversation, developing trust, developing empathy. Uh, which is the ground for a particular woman to agree to being photographed and to collaborate on photography, which is the, the kind of absolute um, blood of image-making devices, whether it's the mobile phone or uh, the cheap digital camera, has, I think, altered even um, this kind of what seems very interesting, this intersubjectivity, self-representation, actually, falls by the wayside when you look at the selfie. These same women today are using mobile phones to make selfies. So there's another image regime that's coming to place. So it's, you know, one has to also look at this historically and in terms of different kinds of subjectivities and different kinds of subjective relationships to imaging that are being produced and that are changing. <coughs> I'm a little bit curious about this idea of crisis as a cultural site. Uh, it's, it's more uh, kind of an observation. Uh, but I feel like uh, any kind of crisis, it offers a tremendous uh, fertile ground for artists to, and intellectuals to study, to do research, to engage with people, to, to, do, negotiate, like, to, do, nego to negotiate, to collaborate. Uh, artists also produce, uh, but when they the challenge to present work, it seems, uh, the way artists present themselves, it seems like they are doomed to the situation. Uh, it's no more a, uh, so they undermine the artistic process, artistic processes, artistic labor. Uh, 
and the also products. So what do you think about this uh, idea? And another question is, uh, I find it very interesting the way uh, here we take names of Gujarat, or Kashmir, or Odisha, or Bihar, and Chhattisgarh border, um, and uh, Assam. Uh, if you guys, if if uh, you would be invited to do some uh, videos of uh, videos for tourism department, suppose for Gujarat tourism or Kashmir tourism, how, how would you do it? What kind of images you would take to the to promote Kashmir tourism or Gujarat tourism? Who's the question addressed? It's uh, to all of us. I think when you say that uh, the crisis seems to represent a productive space for uh, artistic and intellectual inquiry, I think this is kind of retrospective. You don't go into crisis as a productive space. You are either drawn there because of your politics or your concern, or because of a particular incident which draws you into a relationship with that crisis, where you begin to feel, where you begin to engage with it. So yes, the sense of the crisis happening to you, and then you inquiring into the crisis. Uh, it, it's also a, a, a loop. So it's not that, you know, this is a productive space where you go towards crisis looking for some kind of uh, particular artistic edge. No. And I don't think if you've engaged with Gujarat and Kashmir politically that you can ever think of it as a place where you can do touristic images. 